Hello, hello, Awesome Soul here, and welcome to my latest class for D&D, The Channeler, a power-up style martial class that wields extra planar energies. What does this mean, you might ask? Is this some sort of weird Goku power-up Super Saiyan magical girl anime-inspired class? No, but also yes. I'll get into it. Um, so it's not an on-the-nose kind of thing, but it is inspired by aspects and tropes such as those. So if you're into that, stick around. And if you're not into that, also stick around. Because this class is pretty unique, at least in my opinion. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump in and go over what this class is about. So I just want to point out the character artwork. Everything you see in this book as far as artwork goes, or at least you know, the majority of it, uh, is done by Sam, the artist that I work with, and they are beautiful when it comes to their art. It is stunning, and again, I just want to make a huge shout out. Thank you. Uh, also, Patreon supporters, Critical Clown, um, Small Bigs, I believe that's how you're supposed to say it, and Wandering Draco, thank you for your continued support. If you would like to get your name in my classes, well, I, I think you know where to go. Patreon should be in the description. Anyway, without further ado, what is the channeler all about? I'm not going to read this all out for you. If you want to, you can pause and read it for yourself, but quick breakdown. The channeler is a martial class that goes and looks in upon themselves, drawing in from their own life force, and then eventually, in their training, reaching outward to extraplanar energies, harnessing them and using them in battle to increase their power as the fight goes on. But in doing so, there is a risk involved. So this class is very risk-reward type of, uh, or has a very type of thing going on. Um, so if you like that, again, stick around and we shall go over what this class is getting. So, to start out with, at the very beginning, this is a D10 class. Um, I toyed around with the idea of making it a D12, just because, uh, well, you'll see in a little bit with their transcendence feature, the, the risk involved is health related. Um, proficiencies. You're going to get light armor, medium armor, shields, but not heavy armor. I feel that this class has quite a lot going on, and there are a few things you can sort of use to mitigate damage. Uh, if you make your build in a certain way, you can do that. Or again, if you want to go for just big raw damage, support uh, or what have you. You can kind of build this character in a lot of ways. As far as weapons go, they get simple and martial weapons because, wow, surprise, it's a martialist. Um, your saving throws for this one are constitution and charisma. Now, the reason I went with charisma is because of the whole looking in upon yourself, um, drawing upon your own life force type of thing. It's like a force of will uh, control over not only your body, but your personality. At least that made sense to me. Uh, past that, you get some skills, you get equipment. Uh, you're also probably noticing Arcana. Why is Arcana on the list for a martialist? Um, well, you're drawing from extra planar energies. I think that's fairly magical. Uh, before I go on, though, I'm sure some of you are being like, wait a second. So this is magical, but it doesn't have spells. And yes, that's correct. That's intentional. Um, at a brief moment in this class's life, I did toy around with giving it spellcasting, but that very quickly went away uh, because this class has way too much going on and I did not want to compromise my vision. And as you've seen with the Golemancer, just because it's magical does not mean it needs spellcasting. There are a lot of cool ways to make a magic-based character 
that don't necessarily revolve around just slapping in spell casting and calling it a day. I mean, hey, if you want to do that with your class, nothing wrong with that. I just like to, uh, every now and then, sort of push the envelope a little bit and come up with extra magic-adjacent systems. Anyway, without further ado, let's get actually into the meat here. So, uh, I will go over channeler arts when I'm talking about transcendence, because they're very tied together. But first off, let's go with meditation. Meditation is your way to heal out of combat. So this isn't kind of like a fighter second wind where they can use it in combat. This is one where you can spend a minute to meditate out of combat and then roll your hit dice. So this is using a feature that's very underutilized in D&D, which of course is your hit dice. And as we'll see in a bit, you're going to need to use this. Um, so, Transcendence. Why is this at second level when this is a power-up class? The transcendence, if you want to take a first level dip into this class, if that was at first level, this would be a no-brainer, basically, for any other class. Barbarian, boom. Fighter, boom. Ranger, boom. You know, why would you not want to get Transcendence? Uh, that being said, though, uh, you can only transcend to a certain uh, level, depending on uh, the maximum transcendence column, as we can see here. Uh, I sure hope my mouse is visible on the recording. Uh, if not, just use your imagination as where I'm circling my mouse frantically right now. Anyway, what you're going to get with transcendence is, over the course of the battle, you can increase your power, increasing your defenses and your critical range. So, uh, your range basically is reduced or widened or what, whatever wordage you want to use there, I know people use multiple terms, um, by a rate equal to 20 minus your transcendent state. So if you are in state 1, your crit range is between 19 and 20. Uh, or, well, including those two numbers, you know what I mean. Um, and eventually, it can get pretty low. Like, uh, very, very low. Um, although, still within a range where I feel, uh, there is still definitely a chance of critting. It's not like, okay, cool, 50-50, or it's like, yep, guaranteed to crit. If it was that low, where's the fun? Crits are still meant to be random. But um, this class has a few things that also tie into getting crits. But that's a little ahead of myself. Uh, I should also mention, as I've alluded to before, the Transcended Fortitude, as you can see here. At the end of your turn, you make a con save, um, and if you fail, you take some damage. The higher you transcend, the more difficult this DC is to pass, and not only that, the dice rolled for the force damage you take also increases. So, at Transcendence 1, you're going to take a D6 of damage, and your Fortitude save DC is only 10. That then goes up to 14, with 2 dice, and 18 with three dice, and eventually, once you get to Transcendent State 4, way at level 17, this is going to be a DC 22 save with four dice if you mess up. Uh, so, yeah, in most cases, that's basically a 50-50 chance to fail once you're at Transcendence 4. Um, again, Risk reward because you get a lot of cool things the more you transcend, and that also ties into your uh, subclass as well. Anyway, sorry for spending so much time on transcendence, but that's basically the core feature of the class. The other core is channeler arts. 
So you can basically think of these like a weird mix between uh, a monk's key pool, uh, battle master fighters maneuvers, and they're almost used in a way similar to a uh, paladin smite, but not quite those things. It's also doing its own thing. Anyway, you can pause and read it if you want to. But it's basically, you've got this dice pool, and depending on your transcendent state, you can, uh, when you make an attack, you can chuck in a certain amount of dice depending on your transcendent state. The higher your state, the more you can potentially expend in one burst. The cool thing about this is that ties directly into the crit chance and the risk-reward playstyle of the class. If you're at a really high state of transcendence, and you're like, okay, there's a pretty high chance I'm going to crit. Uh, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to spend five dice all at once. You make your attack. You get a little extra bonus, such as maybe uh, knocking someone prone or what have you. And then you crit. And those five dice now become ten dice. That is pretty beautiful in my mind. Uh, because the alternative would have been playing it safe and being like, okay, well, I'm going to get the same effect, but I'm just going to spend one dice. So cool. You knock someone prone and you do a little bit of extra damage. Oh, what's that? I've crit? Well, that one dice goes from one, two, well, two. Um, not quite as impressive as ten. So, do you want to take the risk and potentially have your enemy uh, being knocked on their ass and probably dead? Well, it'd be more of like a, a lackey. Because um, it's only a D6. But hey, a bunch of D6s can still add up. And those eventually, at level 11, become D8s. Anyway. Enough with the first page. Although I should, I should point out, hey, Planar Calling, your subclass. Wow, exciting. Um, you get things at certain levels, just like all subclasses. Anyway, moving on to the second page, finally. Or, well, the sixth page, but you know what I mean. Infectious Spirit. This is another feature that ties directly into your crit range reduction. So, when you score a critical hit and a creature other than yourself, so this is purely supportive and not self-buffing, uh, that can see or hear you within 120 feet. Um, the way I sort of picture this is like a big triumphant shout that sort of bolsters your allies um, and what have you. So if they're like on the other side of a battlefield, hunkered down behind a wall, cowering in fear, and you've taken the charge, they're now inspired uh, by your infectious spirit. So when you do so, you pick one of the following things. Courage, focus, or fortitude. And you grant them that bonus. This does not expend any of your fighting spirit die, even though it does refer to fighting spirit. Um, the reason for this is because, sure, you're lowering your crit range. But crits are still not a guaranteed thing. So, like, this also only lasts a minute, meaning that basically once the combat is over, they're not gonna have this kind of thing. Whereas, like, a bard, for example, hey, here's this dice. You can now use it out of combat for a skill check. You can't really do anything like that. Like, all the things gained from this uh, feature, I should say, are basically very combat specific, like saving throws, or bonuses to uh, your attack roll. Uh, not damage roll, I should say, just your attack roll. You make it easier to hit, uh, but you're not doing any extra crazy damage. Uh, or fortitude, so, you know, gaining a bit of temp HP, which is something you're really only gonna need in combat. Sure, you know, the dungeon traps, but whatever, you know what I mean. Um, all in all, this is a pretty cool feature, and level 3 is basically where I feel 
okay, cool, you've got your core. You transcend, you crit more, you can use your uh, fighting spirit dice, or you can spend more to potentially do extra big beefy crits. And then Infectious Spirit, you can now get bonuses that help your allies for critting. I really should call this a crit fishing power-up martial class, but then the title, the, the secondary title rather, gets a little bit too long. Um, probably should have gone over that before as the intro selling point, because I know there's a lot of crit fishers out there that want to get all those juicy, juicy crits. Anyway, ability score improvements. This class, um, much like the rogue, they get an extra um, ability score improvement, a tenth. Uh, so the reason I chose this is because, again, very in introspective, looking in upon yourself, channeling your own vitality to, you know, uh, do whatever you need with this class. Um, I, I felt that sort of embodied a person who would want to uh, increase their own uh, potential, whether that be through mind or body. Now, going on, we'll sort of blast through these because, as you can see, they're all pretty straightforward. Ever ready, you can roll for initiative and increase your transcendent state to one instantly. Once per long rest, pretty self-explanatory. That's going to help you um, as you level up, because eventually you're going to get the uh, second state, which I think actually you get at fourth level, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, the person who designed the class remembered correctly. Congratulations. Um, the reason I've done this is because you're, I felt that, you know, starting every single combat from base level you would take a little bit too long. So if you're in a combat where you're like, okay, I really need to get as much power as quickly as possible, boom, ever ready. And eventually, uh, down here with Avenger, if an ally is hit by an attack that crits, fails a saving throw, rolls a death save, or dies, you can use your reaction and your anger and compassion to fuel your transcendence. So this plays into the power of friendship <laughs> that I talked about at the beginning. Um, fighting selflessly and being like, okay, uh, shit's hitting the fan. Maybe I need to uh, go and bring out my inner strength. Speaking of inner strength, well, I should probably say, hey, extra attack. Wow, cool. It's a martialist. Extra attack is pretty given. Anyway, inner strength. Uh, this one... Uh, at earlier in development had a much different use, basically, because channeler arts have a requirement for uh, being in a certain state, and the way it used to work is that you could use the state, um, or lower the state requirement by one, but I felt that got a little bit too clunky and tracking, and then I introduced up here that, where is it? Uh, your maximum transcendence. Because originally you could be like, okay, from second level you can go all the way up to three if you wanted to, but uh, I felt that that was way too difficult of a new player experience for people to grasp um, because they're like, wow, I can go up to three. That's awesome. Let's immediately go all the way up to three. Uh, oh, I'm taking three dice of... De oh, I'm dead. Well, that's not fun. And... Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much not fun. I'm just kind of letting people ease into it. Uh, but this one is, at least in my opinion, a lot more interesting. Because if you roll a 1 or 2 on a Fighting Spirit die, you can choose to re-roll them and take the new result. You can do this up to half your proficiency bonus, round it up. So you can do it a few times uh, per long rest. Um, and then, battle flow. So, initially, when you get your Chandler Arts, you can only use them once per turn. But now, you can perform as many as you want, uh, depending on how many attacks you have, because you're going to get your extra attack, 
And now you've got Battle Flow, which I could have just given them another extra attack, but I that would make them a little bit too close to the fighter. So I think the way I have it here is pretty good. Because the thing you're also getting at 11th level, if you remember, um, your fighting spirit dice go from a d6 to a d8. So not only are your special attacks going to be doing that much more damage, they're also going to be critting for that much more damage. And the, uh, the main thing here... Uh, I have lost my train of thought. But anyways, I'm sure it wasn't that important, hopefully. Um, anyway, Beacon of Hope. So, this one is... If you feel like you're in a good spot, you can potent or uh, intentionally, rather, fail your saving throw for your Transcendence Fortitude and give a massive team buff uh, in the form of your Infectious Spirit options. You can give these to a whole bunch of allies uh, the higher you are Transcended. That also means the higher you're Transcended, the more damage you're taking. So... Big trade-off for potentially a team-wide, um, like, saving throw buff. If you got, like, a big lich, he was, like, doing massive mind control spells or something, and you don't want your barbarian uh, or your fighter to go and turn to their side, well, just buff the whole team and give them a bunch of saving throws. Anyway. Ooh, not that one. There we go. Introspection. This, as I've alluded to a few times, is uh, an aspect the class is all about. I, I thought maybe about giving this earlier, but it has way too many core features that definitely needed to be where they are. So you're going to get this at 15th level, but hey, it's a pretty potent ability. And what you're going to get from this is after you complete some meditation, choose two of the skills you know. Uh, or, well, a few, you know, depending on your proficiency bonus rounded down, as it says here. Uh, once you pick these skills, for the next eight hours, if you fail a skill check with one of the following skills, you can expend a fighting spirit die, letting you roll a d8 and adding it to the result, potentially turning a failure into a success. So, this could help you in combat if you want to make a grappler build, but this is mainly going to be an out-of-combat thing, letting you um, sort of keep up with a lot of the utility people later in the game, because a d8 to a skill check is nothing to scoff at. That's probably going to save you a lot, but it is expanding fighting spirit, which you do get... Um, at a rate equal to your level. So, at level 15, you're going to get 15 of them. Assuming you've gone channeler only, because it's based on your channeler level. So, all you uh, multi-classers out there, um, I see you. Don't try and break things. <laughs> anyway, perfect transcendence. This is when you're going to get your fourth and final state of transcendence. It's exactly like all the other states. You get the crit range reduction, you get your bonus to saving throws, but while in this state, you can attack three times instead of once. And also, if you score a critical hit, you can choose to regain a point of fighting spirit, but you can only do so a limited amount of times. Anyway, at the very end, the penultimate ability also ties into crits. Yes, this is very crit heavy. I've, uh, I definitely should have marketed this more of a crit class. But anyway, once you get to 20th level, it is a very straightforward feature. When you crit, you add twice your modifier to the weapon's damage instead of the regular amount. So... If you've got a big meaty warhammer, or no, let's go with something even meatier, a maul. You swing your maul, you crit. 
you have a plus five to your strength modifier, meaning you add a plus ten and then also double the dice. So, uh, yeah, uh, Graceful Devastation, uh, I think, is a very fitting name for this. Now, this is all your ba uh, base class, but we are going to look at the first class. Your planar calling, or your subclass, rather. So, these are all your subclasses you have to pick and choose from. There are six in this document, which I will scroll up and quickly go over. Um, there we are. So, you've got the third eye. I just realized I've spotted a typo. Typo located! Uh, this is going to be fixed. Uh, this was from my Golemancer. Hmm. Anyway, third eye is your astral plane or astral sea. You've got the elemental conduit, which is, hey, the four elements. You've got the spirit caller, which is the ethereal plane. Uh, no, the mist weaver is the ethereal plane. The spirit caller is Ysgard, or Isgard, or however you want to pronounce it. The bestial shifter is the beast lands, and the mana sculptor is the weave, which I guess technically isn't a plane of existence, but close enough that I figured it would be fun to include. And hey, if you want your magic, pick that one. But anyway, what you're going to get with your third eye, if you pick this subclass, is focused mind at the beginning, which all of the uh, features you see here are very um, scaffolding reliant. So what you're going to get with your third level is it modifies your transcendence. You get extra bonus perks when you transcend. In this case, it'll make it easier for you to hit things and more difficult for our, our enemies to hit you. At sixth level, you're going to get something that augments your meditation feature. And this one lets you cast the arcane eye spell. So basically you open your third eye and it travels around uh, looking at whatever you want it to look at, really. Astral Flood. At ninth level, all your subclasses are going to get a way for you to safely exit Transcendence and also cause quite a bit of devastation. Um, this one is basically a big, massive AoE uh, that grows in size depending on how transcended you are, deals more damage uh, as well, and... They make a saving throw. If they fail, they take some psychic damage. If they pass, they take half as much. If they fail by five or more, they're also stunned until the end of your next turn. Which... Uh, pretty sick nasty. But it's a fail by five or more, which probably isn't going to happen that often, and is very rarely going to happen to any kind of BBEG type creature. This is mainly for mopping up the minions, effectively. Anyway, at 14th level, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get a Telekinetic Tide. And this is, again, part of the scaffolding. At 14th level, you're going to get something that further augments your transcendence. So, dependent on what state of transcendence you are in, you can do more things, more powerful things. The more powerful you are, the more powerful you have transcended. In this case, you can use your mind to telekinetically thrust things or creatures that are around you. Uh, so you can throw, uh, let's just say, something that's not nailed down. I don't know, maybe a big log that's fallen down. Uh, if it's like a, your DM classifies it as a huge object, cool. You can now throw that out of the way, revealing uh, any creatures who are hiding behind it. Or, better yet, just target a creature. If it fails the sa a strength saving throw, you yeah, shove it out of the way. Or, if you really wanted to, shove it straight up into the air where it will then immediately fall back down to the ground, taking some damage. 
So thinking of like a, almost like a force thrust type thing. You thrust them up in the air and slam them back down. Uh, or just move them over to a cliff where they fall off. Bye-bye. Um, chances are, though, once you're at 14th level, um, things are probably going to have some sort of feature to prevent them from falling. Maybe flight, feather fall if you're fighting a wizard, but still, I think that's pretty cool. And last but not least, the 18th level feature. In this case, it's called Perfect Mind, Perfect Body. At 18th level, your subclass option is going to give you something that augments strictly the fourth state of Transcendence, which you get at 17th level, and immediately the next level, it becomes that much more powerful. But as I said at the beginning, that is a 22 DC con save you need to pass every single turn or take 4d6 force damage. This damage cannot be lowered at all. Um, so yeah, uh, not really a great time. But when you're this powerful, does it really matter? Because in this case, while maintaining the fourth state of transcendence, you are immune to being charmed, frightened, and poisoned. That is pretty beefy, if you ask me. Uh, on top of that, you have advantage on all saving throws to resist or end the following effects. Blinded, deafened, diseased, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, prone, restrained, and stunned. So basically, every condition in the game. And, uh, yeah. I think that's definitely a very fitting trade-off to go into the fourth state. And that is where we're going to end our coverage. If you want to see the rest of the subclasses, well, you're probably going to have to go and uh, support me and purchase this title over on the DMs Guild. Link is in the description. Um, but yeah, uh, at the time of doing the video or recording it, uh, it's not released, so it should be fixed by the time it is out. Um... With that being said, I of course have been the Awesome Soul. Let me know what you like about the Channeler. Uh, have you picked it up? Have you tried it out in your game? I would love to hear any sort of feedback. But anyways, I of course have been the Awesome Soul. Stay tuned for more, and I will see you next time. Take care.